דעו את מי שאנו באים היום להספיד. Know whom we have come today to mourn. In a celebrated letter, Rav Moshe Soloveitchik Zatzal wrote about his son, Rav Zatzal, when the Lord was all of 32. In former times, they couldn't even apprehend the possibility of finding Torah and Sha'or Chachmot and general knowledge combined in the same person. Now it's no longer uncommon to happen upon individuals in whom Torah and Chachmot are joined together. But in his instance, and he was speaking of his son, we have at once a Godel Hadar Batora, both in Mavil, Ke Echad Migdole Hadar Bedoros Sakodmin, the Mbishore Chachmos, the Ofen Godel, Hino Yochid Um Yuchad. We have at once a Godel Hadar the greatest Torah scholar of this generation. In astonishing measure comparable to the vaunted Gedolei Hador of earlier periods. At the same time, no less spectacularly singular in the other realms of knowledge as well. And years ago already, Reb Moshe Zetzal continued, the grain of Kovner of Avram Shapiro, author of the halachic mastic work, Dvar Avram, in a sweeping and unparalleled encomium, a copy of which Reb Moshe dutifully enclosed, proclaimed Shehalocha Kamoso Bechol Mokom. The halacha is like him, like the young Reb Yashaber, everywhere. He reigns surely and without peer over the vast, voluminous, and intimidating terrain of the entire corpus of Jewish law and lore. Of course, we have a halachic principle, klum yesh of meid al bino, the testimony of a father in behalf of his son is inadmissible. Therefore, I want to recount publicly for the first time something my grandfather Yaakov Moshe Zechet Tzadik Levracha told me on my initial visit to Eretz Yisrael in the summer of Tuf Shintes, 1949, one year after the establishment of the State of Israel. He questioned me about my chinuch, my education, where I was learning. When I told him that the yeshiva saw Ben Yitzchok Ochan and his face lighted up, and he exclaimed, you're a Talmud of Rabbi Yeshebeir? I was only a young teenager then, and I had to explain to him that it would be several years before I could even begin to hope to be allowed into his year. With profound disappointment, he said in Yiddish, Ashod, what a loss. And he continued, I heard Rav Soloveitchik when he gave his shir at Yeshiva Smerkaz Arab. In fact, I introduced him then. I had never heard a shir like his before. And then he added, Ich lo gegeigen schon lein zu fuss, Herren seinem shir. I would go on foot for hours to hear his shir. And he wasn't referring merely to the Rav's awesome ability to communicate for which he probably had no equal, but to his thrusting originality and the solid clarity of his creative insight into the most complicated and abstruse problems of Allah. Mind you, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe, the last Talmud of Rabbi Yeshua Leib Biskin Zatzal, who before he came to Yerushalayim was the rabbi of Brisk, the predecessor to the Beis HaLevi, 
the love of Zetzal's great-grandfather and his eponym, who began the luminous Soloveitchik dynasty in that hoary and ancient center of Jewish learning. The Yeshua Leib was described as the Go'in HaGo'inim, the genius of the geniuses. It is said that Rabbi Chaim Halevi's hands used to shake whenever he uttered the name of Rabbi Yeshua Leib. Nonetheless, my grandfather was able to say about the young Rabbi Yeshebeh, I never heard a cheer like his. And when some years later I finally entered the Rav Shir, I began to sense at least, although not in the fullness of his understanding, what my grandfather meant. However, it was not until I returned to Yeshiva years later, and it became my ineffable privilege to relate directly with the Rav, dealing intimately with him almost on a day-to-day -day basis that I began to know that his incredible prodigiousness of mind was very much matched by nobility of spirit and an authentic piety that were no less remarkable in their way than his incomparable intellect. That as great as his Torah was, his year of Shemayim and his Derech Haritz were no less startling, some of which may have been obscured by the essential humility that was the law, it was called Motum Shata Motza Gudulaso Shom Ata Motza Andrasaniso. When we were his students, there was distance between him and us, measured in the geography of reverence and awe. As a teacher, he was stern and sometimes frighteningly demanding. But now, up close, I saw the vivid and pulsating realization of Rashi's Chochma Yiras Hashem. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And Derech Eretz human concern and sensitivity, is a preamble to Torah. Do es misha anubayim hayom lahaspid. As part of our mourning for the Rav Zatzal and in the most authentic tradition of B'nai Torah, for a great Rebbe, for a Godel Hador, for Rabban Shokol Yisrael, the yeshiva, its students, Rabbeim and Anhola, here in Israel and in California, have undertaken to complete and study Kol HaTorah Kula, the entirety of the original and chief foundation stones of Torah by the Shloshim, which is Yud Tessir, Monday, May 10th, when we will mark in an, an unprecedented Siyum Al Kol HaTorah Kula, the division of the whole Tanakh, Torah Nevim Iksubim, has been assigned to the young ladies of our Stirring College for Women and our high school for girls. As for Torah Shavar Peh, the oral law, the Mishnayas, the Shisha Sidre Mishnah, have been distributed among the students of our high school for boys. And finally, Shas itself has and is being divided among the Talmidim of the Yeshiva and its various schools of Jewish learning. Very probably the greatest legacy the Rav Zatzal leaves behind are his Talmidim, who are now themselves Ramim in Rosh Yeshiva in our Yeshiva and elsewhere, and who are numbered in the front rank of Talmidi Chachomim and Mabitzei Torah of our time. I don't believe that any Rebbe or Rosh Yeshiva has bequeathed to the next generation after him such a brilliant and richly diverse, and that is a key phrase, galaxy of Talmudian disciples. Largely because of the Rav's Tzatzal, Yeshiva has managed to reproduce itself. In generations past, we had to scour the earth looking for great Rosh Yeshiva. Today, Baruch Hashem, they grow in our own backyard, and that is owing almost entirely to him. There can be no more meaningful tribute than have these Talmidim become Rabbeim, share with their Talmidim the Torah they learned at his feet, as they indeed do willy-nilly almost every day of their teaching lives in any event. Nearly every night of this period of mourning and remembrance at 9.15 p.m. in the main base Medrash, they will be giving shirim on the Rav Zatzal Torah. We have prepared and distributed flyers indicating the schedule of these shirim 
which is open to the entire public. I call upon Rabbi Israel Miller, Senior Vice President of Yeshiva, to say the Pitul Tilim, Pasuk by Pasuk, and you should have the sheets of the Tilim in your hands, and various appropriate Kapitel Tilim will be said during our program. We will begin with Perik Tzadik at the bottom of the sheet which you have. Tzfila lemoshe ish ho Elohim Adonai ma'on ato ha'isalahanu b'dohar v'dohar Terem Harim Yulahadu, Vat Cholel Eretz Visevel, Umeolam Adolam Ato El. Toshev Enosh Adako. Vatomer Shuvu Vinayadam Ki Elef Shanim Bienecha Ki Onesmo Ki Avohor Viashmuro Valoilo Zram tam shena yihiyu Babo ker kachatsir yachalov Babo ker yatsits vichalov La erev yimoleo viyavesh Ki chalino v'yapecho u'vachamascho nivhonu. Shato avono seno l'negdecho alumeno l'imiyo arpanecho. Ki kho yameinu panu v'yavra secha Ki l'inu shaneinu kamo hege Yamei shino seinu bohem shivim shana V'im b'gvuros shmonim shana V'rachbam amal v'aven Ki gaz chish vana ufa. Mi yodea o zapecha, o chirasecha, evrasecha. Limnos yameno kain hodaha Venavi levav chokma Shuvo adonai ad mosohoi Vinochem al avodecha Sabeinu vaboker chazdecha Unranenu venismecha Becha yameinu Samecheinu kimau sinisanu Shnaus rainu ra'a Yerai alavadecha pa'alecha 
Adarecha Abenehem. Vihi Noam Adenai Eloheinu Aleinu, Uma Seyadenu Konen Aleinu, Uma Seyadenu Konen Ehu. Please be seated. <clears throat> the Torah records Vayikach Moshe Esatzmos Yosef Imo in fulfillment of the request of Yosef as the Bnei Yisrael left Mitzrayim Moshe Rabbeinu took with him the remains of Yosef. It has been remarked that it was not only the physical remains of Yosef that were carried by our ancestors in the Midbor, the Atzamos, but the Atzmius, the vital essence of Yosef, which they took with them. It is the Atzmius, the majestic persona of our unforgettable Rebbe, our revered teacher and guide, Harav Yosef Ber Zatzal, that we call to mind this morning in our yeshiva, in his yeshiva, in this auditorium, which still echoes with his profound, instructive, and inspiring words. In tribute to the memory of our Rebbe, the Rav Zatzal, it is my privilege to present one of the Rav's most gifted students, the president of Yeshiva University, of Yeshivas Rabbeinu Yitzchak Hanan, our Rosh HaYeshiva, Dr. Norman Lam, who has the honor of being the only Musmach of our Yeshiva to receive from the Rav Zatzal both his smicha and his doctorate at the Bernard Revel Graduate School, Harav Nachum Lam. Sar the Godel Nafal Hayom Bi Israel. We have lost the Sar Hatora and the Godel Yisrael. Surely such a Sar, such a prince, and such a giant, who became a legend in his own lifetime, deserves an appropriate eulogy. I therefore begin with a confession. I feel uncomfortable and totally inadequate in the role of a maspid for my Rebbe, the Rav, Zechat Tzadik Levracha. Only one person could have done justice to this task, and that was the Rav himself. Everyone else remains somewhat in the category of a maspid shaloika halacha, and nevertheless, we owe it to him to try our best, and so I ask you your and his forgiveness at the very outset. The Rav was Niftar on the exact same day that 17 years ago we lost the late president of Yeshiva, Dr. Samuel Belkin, Belkin and the Rav himself was Maspid Dr. Belkin from this very podium on the same day, ere of the last days of Pesach, 
that he was to be led to Menuchas Elamim. He referred to him then in his Hesped as Arami Oved Ovi, a wandering Litvak who as a youngster was forced from his native town and took the wanderer's staff to these shores all by himself. Unlike Dr. Belkin, the Rav was not an Arami Oved. He was not orphaned at an early age. On the contrary, he had the advantage of a stable aristocratic home of encouraging and even doting parents. He was heir at birth to a distinguished lineage, the Beis Harav, that of Reb Moshe, Reb Chaim, the Beis Alevi, the Netziv, Reb Chaim Velozhina. His genius <coughs> was recognized while he was still a tut. At age six, his father hired a Malamed to come to the house to teach him. The tutor was a Chabad Chosid, who also taught the little boy Tanya without asking leave of his parents. He learned it so well that the Moshe was frightened at the prospect of his little son becoming a chassid and fired the Malamed. He then became a disciple of his own father, of the Moshe Zechrein Levacha, demanding, challenging, and critical, yet approving and proud. At the age of 10, the young Rabbi Yosheber presented to his father his written Chidushe Torah. His father was so impressed that he showed it to his father, Rabbi Chaim. He, in turn, was so impressed that he shared it with his dayan, Rabbi Simcha Zelig. And, of course, he prophesied greatness for his precocious grandson. The Rav's development continued unimpeded, fulfilled, and exceeded the hopes of father and grandfather. The former Rav Rashi of Israel, Rav Avram Shapiro Shalita, told me the following story to which he was a personal witness. When the Rav came to Eretz Yisrael, the one and only time during his life in 1935, it was the last year of the elder Rav Kook, the Rav Rashi. The Rav spoke in several places. He spoke in the Harry Fischel Institute, in the Merkaz Harav, and a number of other yeshivas. At every shir that he gave, Rav Kook's son, Rav Tzvi Yehuda, who passed away only a few years ago, attended and listened attentively. When Rabbi Shapiro asked the younger Rav Kook why he was doing so, he answered as follows. He said his father received the young Goran from America, Rabbi Soloveitchik, and some Gadetan Lernin. They talked Torah. When Rabbi Soloveitchik left, the father, Rav Kook, told his son that the experience of speaking with Rabbi Yosheber Soloveitchik reminded him of his earliest years in Volozhin, when his grandfather, Rav Chaim, started to give shiurim. And I believe, Rav Kook said, that the koyach ha-ga'oynes from Zayden is arayn in Enikol. The power of the genius of the grandfather now resides with the grandson, and therefore make sure you don't miss a single shear that the Yosheb Be'er is going to give. But if unlike Dr. Belkin, the Rav was not an Arambi Ovedovi, then we may say of him that he, he embodied another passage in the Haggadah. Your children will be gayed in strangers and in land that is not theirs. The Rav was not a wandering Aramean, but a lonely Abrahamite, a lonely Litvak. And this loneliness was one of the most painful and enduring characteristics of his inner life. This giant who was at home in every discipline, a master of an astounding variety of branches of wisdom, familiar with almost every significant area of human creative intellectual enterprise, felt ultimately like a stranger dwelling in someone else's land, Eres Lolehem. Somehow the Rav did not fit in to any of the conventional categories. His genius was such that the loneliness attendant upon it could not be avoided, a fact which caused him no end of emotional anguish, yet gave us the gift of his phenomenal and creative originality. He was both destined and condemned to greatness and its consequences. This sense of loneliness and isolation and differentness had a number 
of different sources, quite different sources, all of which reinforced each other. One was emotional, began quite early in his life. The Rav pointedly describes in his Ovikashta Misham his early experiences of fear of the world, of social detachments, his feeling of being mocked and rejected and friendless. The only friend he had was the Rambam. And as he grew older, the other Chachmei HaMesara, whom he encountered in his learning. The Rav identifies this as more than imagination or fantasy, but as a, as a profound experience, the experience of the Mesora of Torah Shabbal Peh. And yet, the sense of social loneliness and emotional solitude was not dissipated. Indeed, that was the way he was brought up. He tells us that he was taught to hide his emotions. He was never kissed by his father. He had no real friends in his childhood or youth and probably no truly intimate comrades in his adulthood. This sense of alienation was not only a psychological and social factor in the various roles that all played in life, it was also central to his whole conception of life. His most characteristic form of analysis in his great philosophical essays and oral discourses was the setting up of typological conflicts almost shnei two different types uh, of conflict, of, of antithesis. Adam one and Adam two, Isha Alocha and Isha Elohim, the covenant of faith and the covenant of destiny, majesty and humility, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, conflict and dissonance make for inner alienation and loneliness. This philosophical approach I believe stems from two sources. One was his attempt, probably developed during his years in Berlin, to defend Yahadus from the encroachment of a self-confident and aggressive natural science and equally arrogant then modern philosophy. To counter them, that of adopted the Neo-Kantian view in which there is a distinct chasm or gap that separates the natural order of objectivity and quantification and number and determinism, at least on a macro scale, from the internal human realm of the subjective, the qualitative, and passionate area where freedom reigns. The second source is, I believe, the hashkafa of his misnagdic ancestor, Chaim Velazhina, who saw the world and all existence as multi-layered, as plural, as reflected in the halacha, which makes distinctions, very serious distinctions, tohor and tomei, achayev and osel, achatchile, bedieved, kodesh, chol, as in the mission of Eser Kedusha saying, as against the Hasidic view of a monistic, unified world, one which tended to blur distinctions and sought to overcome countries. Thus, for instance, Dav Kuk, strongly influenced by the Hasidic side of his lineage, saw underlying unity uh, beyond all the phenomena of fragmentation and opposition, while the Rav's view was anything but harmonistic. He saw not wholeness, but conflict, chaos, and confrontation in the very warp and woof of life. Man, he held, was constantly beset by a torn soul and a shattered spirit, by painful paradoxes, bedeviled by dualities, and each day forced to make a choice, often fateful ones, in the confrontation of savage countries, of the jarring clash of claims and counterclaims in both concept and in conduct. Both these sources, the Neo-Kantian and the thought of Reb Chaim Velozhina, see fundamental disunity and a fractionation of experience in the world. Such a vision of contradiction and incongruity leads inexorably to anxiety and tension and restlessness, to a denial of existential comfort and spiritual security. It results in loneliness. The Rav was truly the lonely man of faith. And his, this philo philosophically articulated loneliness with its depth crises became enduring and especially poignant, poignant 
when it was superimposed on a natural tendency to solitude and feelings of Kiger Yeh Zalacha, the heiress Lola Hem. Yet paradoxically, in practice, he made strenuous efforts to overcome these dichotomies, to heal the wounds of the sundering of experience and existence, to achieve the unity of man with himself, with, it, with nature, with society, with an abode shalom, even though he knew that ultimately such attempts were doomed to frustration. Hence his efforts to bridge the worlds of emotion and reason, of halacha and agoda, of Hasidus and his nagdus. Perhaps the very attempt for achtus and shlemus reflected his penchant for shalom, for peace, a goal he valued and cherished, although he knew that in reality, disharmony and the pain of inexorable conflict and contradiction controlled. For instance, take Machshava, where his fertile mind really reigned supreme. He was a stranger amongst those who work in the area of Jewish philosophy, because he came to it from another world, another world. One of godless Petora, mastery of halacha, as well as the classics of both general and Jewish thought, and his assumptions, his aspirations, his insights were derived from halacha, not keeping halacha irrelevant fundamentally from his, from his genuine thought, his philosophical thought. Thus, for instance, the those famous reconciliation of the machlokes, the Rambam and Ramban, as to whether tefillah is midiyadaisa or midiyadabonon, which became for him the source of his teaching on death crisis of everyday life. Among such Jewish thinkers, he was really alone, a stranger, a ger be'edes lo'lehem. He was a lonely Litvak. Similarly, he was a master darshan, endowed with a richness of homiletic ingenuity, combined with charismatic rhetorical prowess and stellar oratory. Undoubtedly, the gadol hadarshanim of our and perhaps several generations. Yet he had no peer, no companion, no friend in this area too. The kind of drush that even the best of them practiced was not his home, was not his way. I can hardly envision the Rav calling another Rav and saying, what are you going to say this, Yantif? <laughs> or give me an idea. It's inconceivable. This was, not, this was not the Rav. He was just, he's a man who could be as ingenious and more so than the cleverest of them, with a sense of timing and drama that were astounding. But his uniqueness, his uniqueness lay in a synthesis of both halacha and machshava, rather than conventional drush, but expressed in a midrashic medium. So here too he was a ger with the other balei drush in Eretz Lolehem. It was not his home. Even in halacha, where he was our generation's undisputed balabayas, he still was, in essence, ger be'eres lo'lehem. Other gadolei hador were also, are also gifted thinkers capable of incisive insights. But he alone, in addition to his, his cognitive supremacy, his dazzling definitions, his, his brilliant formulations, had a broader scope by virtue of his wider knowledge and exposure to other modes of reasoning, which he maintained helped him in his halacha creativity, so that he was singular among the giants of halacha of our time. Thus his quality as a lonely litvak often expressed itself as well in his defiance of convention in many ways, in dress, in demeanor. He simply refused to conform to standards imposed from without, whether they were intellectual or dealt with the niceties of style. How does the Rav, as a lonely man of faith, overcome these bouts of loneliness, given his conception of, of the dialectic and conflict as inscribed in human nature and existence itself? He tells us, and it tells us a great deal about him. First of all, his early emotional and social loneliness became bearable when he found fulfillment in his domestic life. Anyone who was privileged to visit with him and the late Rebetzin, Allah Sholem, in their home in the Boston area could tell immediately that for the Rav, his home was a haven and even a heaven. 
Do we not recall a terrible scene with the bitter tears that he shed when he gave the Hespid for the Levitson? The second way in response to his existential loneliness was spiritual. The man whose goal was never mere peace or happiness, but truth, was able to assuage the feelings of Ger Yia by his deep and unshakable amuna. Rabbi Chalap mentioned his Yira Shemayim. The lonely Abrahamite knew not only the anguish of alienation inflicted upon our ancient forebear, or rather his children, but Avram's secret. And that was Umbatsasa Eslavavo Ne'eman Lefanecha, a faithful heart, a heart of Emunah. How does Emunah overcome the loneliness of the stranger, the alien, the gare? Perhaps by understanding that none is more lonely, Kaviyachal, than the Kaviyachal himself. Man's loneliness and Israel's loneliness, says Amlevadodyishkon, are both reflections of the divine loneliness. Even as he is Echad, the unsurpassably and ineffably one, so he is incomparably alone, Ein Od Milvado, and doesn't such absolute and transcendent aloneness imply from a human perspective unparalleled and unimaginable loneliness? HaKadosh Baruch Hu reaches out to his human creatures seeking, as it were, the spiritual companionship of human beings. The mitzvah of Yahatas Hashem must be put side by side with that the Gemara says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu mis'ava l'tvilosan shel tzadikim. God deeply desires mis'ava lusts for the tfila, the relationship, the companionship of tzadikim. And man eases his own pitiful terrestrial loneliness by linking his loneliness to the majestic loneliness of the divine. So does loneliness join loneliness. And out of this encounter is born the divine human companionship nourished by divine chesed and human amuna. Bands of friendship are created as man gratefully acknowledges Rabbanu Shalom as Dodi, my beloved. And the Rabbanu Shalom regards a lonely Abrahamite as Avraham Ohavi. Such exaltation came to the Rav, and I'm saying nothing new, just recapitulating what he writes and says. It came to him during Tefillah, during these precious moments and hours suffused with the purest Amuna, the Rav found both the truth and the peace to which he devoted his life as his riven soul was healed and unified. You recall his moving description and his majesty and humility of his experience of prayer when the late Rebbe Sinalei HaSholem lay dying in the hospital, or reread so many other of his famous Ma'amorim, his essays, where he bears his soul and reveals the depths and the heights of Amunah Tahora as expressed in Tefillah and the companionship of the Rabbani Shalom. Finally, he was able to abolish or at least moderate both forms of his loneliness intellectually, and that in a most paradoxical manner. He found peace and tranquility on the battlefield of Halacha during his Urim here at Yeshiva. Chazal often speak of halachic debate as masa umatan shal halacha, the give and take of halacha, but masa umatan means business. It's like a business negotiation, except you deal in the coin of ideas and concepts. But there's also another kind of description Chazal gives. There are many descriptions. There's masa umatan, nochen zezeh ba'alocha, machadadin zezeh ba'alocha, and ba'mem adlikan, there's a whole list. But there's also another word, and that's esek ha'alocha, al tisasku ba'alocha, that doesn't mean to be engaged in. It comes from the word ki his asquimo, ken kora shem ha be'er, esek ki his asquimo, struggle, strife, argument, almost a war to the finish. That is what I think of when I make the bracha la sok Torah and follow it immediately with vahavevna. La sok Torah, to struggle and fight, the afal pikein, it always remains vahavevna, sweet. Engaged in a war of wits with his own students, parrying ideas and interpretations, entering the fray between Rashi and Tresis and Amban and Lamban and Amban and Balamor 
and, and trying to resolve their differences in his typical brisket derech, which he inherited and then modified, there, in that hot, very difficult battle, there he found his peace and his companionship. Permit me to relate to you a story that I've told elsewhere. It was my second year in Ashir, and I was intimidated, very intimidated, and in awe of him, as was every other Talmud, that is, almost every other Talmud. There was one student who I believe was the youngest one in the class, and also one of the brightest, who was clearly the least frightened or awed of the dog. Great respect, but he wasn't overwhelmed with fear. The Rav had been developing one line of thought for two or three weeks when, his tom when this Talmud casually said, but Rebbe, the Chidushi Aran says such and such which destroys your whole Svara. Rav was taken aback and he put his head into his hands for two or three excruciatingly long minutes while we were all silent. Then he looked up, perplexed, upset, put his hand in his pocket, where he kept his notes usually, opened them up, took a pencil, and crossed out page after page after page, and says, the shear is over. We were only one half hour into a two and two and a half hour shear. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I learned two things from this remarkable episode. First, we were overwhelmed by his astounding intellectual honesty. With his mind, he could easily have wormed his way around, maneuvered a text, a svara, and somehow managed to rescue both his shita and his ego. But that wasn't the Rav. He did nothing of the sort. He taught by example that the overarching goal of Talmud Torah is bakosha sa emes. And if he had to confess to the youngest student in class that he made a mistake, he crossed out page after page. He in encouraged independent thinking by his students as a way to ensure the pursuit of truth of MS in Torah. The Rav was authoritative, but he was not authoritarian. No Musa Shmuis could have so successfully inculcated in us the respect for MS at all costs. The second lesson came with the anticlimax of the story, because the very next day, it was a Wednesday, the Rav walked into class with a broad, happy grin on his face. Oh, he looks just wonderful. He held out the copy of the Chidusha Yaran and says, now read this correctly. Of course, the Rav was right. The student had misread the source. What did we learn from this? A secret of his greatness and success as a teacher. Namely, and this has been helpful to me throughout my life in teaching, his preparation. The Rav never got up to speak or give a shear without being as prepared as one could be. You see, I always thought that there was a vast difference between his public drushes, his formal drushes, and his shirim in class. The formal drushes were finished, polished, conceptually or rhetorically complete products, a joy to behold, and each of them a marvel of organization and architectonics. The shirim he gave in class were of an altogether different genre. They were dynamic and stormy as he formulated ideas, experimenting with a variety of spheres, testing, advocating and discarding, proving and disproving, as he brought us into his circle of creativity and forced us to think as he thinks, and thus learning his methodology. A sheer by the Rav in class was a no-holds-barred contest. I would call it a halachic free-for-all, an open-ended process instead of a predetermined lecture. Well, that incident proved otherwise. He actually pulled out his handwritten notes for this year. We were confounded. It was all prepared in advance. Yet the greatness of it all was that on the one hand, he prepared assiduously for every year, leaving as little as possible to chance, and on the other hand, Despite his thorough preparation, the Shia always was open-ended, always, because he listened carefully and encouraged any serious challenge by even Hakotan Shebet the youngest of his students, and he was ready to concede an error. 
And all through this, so successful was he in engages, uh, engaging us in the act of creation of Chidush, that we never realized that he had thought it all out ahead in advance before he came into the classroom. I always felt, at a shear of the Dov, that it was like being present at Mamish, the, the moment of Briyas Olam, the moment of creation, with all its raw and primordial drama as conceptual galaxies emerge from the chaos of Kashis, as mountains collided and separated, as finally a clear and pellucid light began to shine upon us, bringing forth new and exciting worlds. He was able to combine preparation and openness, determination and freedom, the fixed and the fluid. What a master pedagogue, Inka Mahu. So awesome was this performance as both a thinker and a teacher that emerging from an encounter with the Rav, whether publicly or privately, in class or in an article, especially in class, in halacha, machshava, but especially halacha, it was impossible to avoid feelings of grave inadequacy. He gave me a vast inferiority complex. Each of us would think, how could I ever attain such, such depths, such heights of content and style, of thought and language? You know, in students, that usually resulted in hero worship. In colleagues and contemporaries, it sometimes eventuated in envy, in, in envy and let it be said, even enmity. It's a measure of Rav's character that he was not spoiled by our adulation and he ignored the slurs against him. He never publicly or privately, to my knowledge, ever mentioned them. You see, giants pay no attention to mosquitoes. Whenever I think back to the Rav as a Magad Shia, I recall the, the fascinating tale recorded in Pika de Rabelezer. Rabbi Eliezer comes to Yerushalayim, where he meets his Rabbi, Rabbi Yechonim ben Zakkai. Rabbi Yechonim ben Zakkai invites his pupil to say Torah, and Rabbi Eliezer declines. He explains, look, all the Torah I have, I got from you. How can I have the chutzpah to give a shir in your presence? Rabbi Yechonim ben Zakkai says to him, don't worry. You can say Torah more than Moshe received at Har Sinai. What more of a compliment do you want? Rabbi Leza was, just felt he couldn't do it, so Rabbi Yechon and Zakkai went out of the Bismedrish and listened in from behind the door. And then the Pekad Rabbi Leza tells us, His face shone like the sun. The Karnos of Yosos, Karnos, Moshe, and his, his, there were beams of light issued from his face as they did from Moshe Rabbeinu. Leinon of Yodeya in Yom ve'im Laila, so that you couldn't tell if it was day or night. And when he finished, Bara B'yachanon and the Shokai al-Rosha, Rabbi Yechanan came in and kissed him on his head. And he said to him, Ashreichem Avraham Yitzchak V'yakov Sheyotza Zem Michal Atzeichem. How lucky are Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, that such a one came from them. Whereupon his father, Rabbi Eliezer's father, Hukanus, the rich, powerful, wealthy Hukanus, who tried to discourage his son from becoming a Talmud Chacham and wanted to come into his business instead. Hukanus said, in a change of mind, Lo loma, no Rabbi Yechanan, I have something better to say. Ashrei ani shiyotza zeh michalotzai. How lucky am I to have such a son? Indeed so. The Rav's Torah was a revelation of Torah in its own right. There was something radiant about him. His vigor, his dynamism, as the original analyses and pursuit of truth and creative gestures poured forth from him in such triumphant excitement. As a Rebbe or teacher, he was simply unsurpassed. His gift for explanation, for being masber a difficult concept or machlokis or text, was sheer genius. Happy are the others of our people. Happy are the others of our Rebbe, Reb Moshe, Reb Chaim, Zechreinam Bevocha. But happiest of all are those of us who had the great schus to be his Talmidim 
and to sit in on his shiurim. And I must say how sad I am for our younger Talmidim who did not have and will never be so privileged. At best, we will try to give them a reflection, cliche of the Rav's greatness. What kind of person was he? Despite his no-nonsense attitude while teaching, he was a man of sensitivity and graciousness. And I hope that people will not mistake what I say when I add that he was, in the best sense of the word, a gentleman. He had impeccably good manners and sensitivity. He might be a terror in the classroom, which he was, but he was attentive and polite and accepting and warm outside this year. He possessed great chesed and was a stalker. He was also very vigorous. In the days of his strength, the Emei Aliyah, did you ever try walking with him? The Rav never walked. He ran, almost as if his body was trying to keep up with his ideas and with his mind that were ahead of him. Vigor, dynamism, vibrancy dominated his being from his lumbers to his gait. But above all, the Rav was a man of independence. He was a true heir of his great-great-grandfather, of Chaim Velazhina, who kept on emphasizing as a Talmud of the Gaon that Talmud Torah, in Talmud Torah, one must go after the truth no matter who stands in your way. And so the Rav was his own man and often went against the grain of accepted and conventional opinion. Once, after, I was not witness to this, but I heard of it, after a particularly creative sheer, a masterful sheer, someone who was not used to this kind of originality came to him and said, but Rabbi Soloveitchik, what is your source? And the Rav answered, a clear and logical mind. The Rav was an independent thinker, not only in halacha, not only in machshava, but also in his communal leadership. He had great respect for many or most of his peers, eminent rabbonim and rashi yeshivas of his generation. But the respect did not intimidate him. The Rav rejected kanois as well as katnas hamochen, even as he deplored katani amona. He was not afraid to be in the minority and refused to be cowed by the pressures of the majority. He was horrified by extremism and overzealousness as well as superficiality and phoniness in communal policy-making as much as he contemptuously dismissed them in his learning. And if he sometimes seemed to waver in setting policy or rendering a decision in communal matters, it was because he saw all sides of an argument and was loath to offend or hurt anyone, even if he disagreed with them. For instance, he was almost alone amongst contemporary G'dayli Torah in the way he viewed the emergence of the state of Israel, Medina Yisrael, as a divine chesed. He indeed saw it as the appear its appearance as opening a new chapter in Jewish history, one in which we enter the stage of history once again. He was not afraid, despite not only the opinions of the majority of Choshev Rosh Yeshiva, but also his own distinguished family members. He was not afraid to identify with the goals and aspirations of religious Zionism. Perhaps the most significant area where he diverged from other Gedolim and followed an independent Erech was, regard, was with regard to Lemude Chol, to Torah Amada. The Rav was an intellectual colossus astride the various continents of human intellectual achievement as well as all forms of Jewish thought culturally and psychologically, as well as intellectually. This made him a loner, a loner, amongst the halachic authorities of this century. How many gedolim, after all, how many gedolim in the world have read Greek philosophy in Greek and German philosophy in German and the Vatican statement on the Jews in Latin? A PhD from the University of Berlin in mathematics and especially philosophy he took these dis disciplines seriously, not as inconsequential academic flirtation or a superficial cultural ornamentation as a way of, as a way of impressing benighted and naive American Jewish students who did not know better. There is no doubt where his priorities lay. Obviously, they were in Torah. 
Anyone who knew the man would know that. But he did not regard Mada as a Bediyeved compromise. The Rav believed that the great thinkers of mankind had truths to teach all of us. Truths which were not necessarily invalid or unimportant because they derived from non-sacred sources. Moreover, the language of philosophy was for him the way that the ideas and ideals of Torah can best be communicated universally to cultured people. And he held that his Limudei Chol assisted him in fertilizing his powers of reasoning in halacha. He had no use for the currently popular transcendent parochialism that considers whole areas of human knowledge and creativity as outside the pale. And we were as Talmidim, therefore, must guide against any revisionism, any attempts to misinterpret the Rav's work in both worlds, and not allow the same distortion that has been foisted on the ideas of Shamsher of Earl Hirsch to be done with the Rav. The Rav was not a London who happened to have and use a smattering of general culture. And he most certainly was not a philosopher who happened to be a Talmud Chacham. He was who he was. He was not a simple man. And we must accept him on his terms as a highly complicated, profound, and broad-minded and intentioned personality. And we must be thankful for him. Certain nascent revisionisms may well attempt to disguise and distort his uniqueness by trivializing one or another aspect of his rich personality and work, but they must be confronted at once. Yecheskel Abramsky's Zeche Zadik Lavrocha, when he had to eulogize of Chaim Briska, referred to the Hesbid quoted in Moyed Koton, Im biarozim nofla shal heves, ezove hakir mayasu, if flames consume the great cedars, what shall the, the wallflowers say? And he said, no, not what would they say, but it means this. After the giants have been taken from us, who knows what the dwarves who follow them will do to their teachings. We must constantly beware not to allow the Rav to bend to any side that is not himself. We must guard his teachings, disagree with it if you will, but never put into him things that he was not. He was exceedingly loyal to our yeshiva. Some 14 or 15 years ago, this yeshiva was on the verge of bankruptcy. I asked him to help the yeshiva. I invited him to a critical board meeting at the home of the late, Her the office of the late Herbert Tenza. The Rav came, he took out, as always prepared, even a simple thing like that in front of 25 people or 30 people, took out a paper and read what was really a confession of gratitude, speaking about how we felt about yeshiva, how it provided the platform for him, what it did for his family, and so on and so forth. And he had a great deal to do with the geula, the redemption of this yeshiva. He gave smicha to some 2,000 rabbanim, and thus influenced hundreds of thousands of Jews throughout the world. He allowed us, for our benefit, to name the smicha program the Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik Center for Rabbinic Studies. He was the Ruach Chaim of our yeshiva. He was a man who refused to isolate himself intellectually or in any way. He didn't live in an ivory tower. He saw contact with ordinary Jews. He saw greatness in simple people. He was a rav, a functioning rav of Boston. And his rabbonus in Boston was the perfect counterpoint for his goal, role as a Rosh Yeshiva in New York, because as a result, his halachic decisions were leavened by an awareness of the mitzvahs, the reality of American Jewish life. He dominated the ivory tower. It did not dominate him. He was deeply devoted to his family. I could say much here, but I won't because there are greater authorities than me on that subject who will speak briefly, shortly rather. But most important is what he meant to us as our Rebbe. Despite the austere majesty, the dynamism of this Urim, all of us knew that we had in him a friend, a father, an older brother. We invited him to our weddings and later to our children's weddings, and he came. 
We consulted him on our personal rabbinical problems. He listened and advised, presented Shilas. He taught us as Adarach HaShayel Chubam. He had an enormous emotional pull on his students. I know that there are so many of us, each of whom secretly, and sometimes not so secretly, knows that he was the Rav's favorite student. Maybe. Maybe he had many, many students. Who knows? Maybe he had none. Because who could really capture the tremendous variety as well as genius of his thought and his work in all areas? It's a Herculean task. But can't the same thing be said about the Rambam? Some of whose students followed his halakha and some his philosophy, very few, if any, both. The Rav did not demand of us obedience. The Rav never blurred the, the distinctions between the role of a Rashi Yeshiva and a Hasidic Shadeva. He aspired to have Talmidim, not Hasidim. He wanted challenging, independent-minded, questioning disciples, not accepting unquestioning acolytes. And that is the way he forced us to think independently. His pshat and ha'amidu ta'amidem harbei was not only to have many students, but ha'amidu, put them on their own feet, let them think for themselves. And he encouraged us as well to paskana shayla ourselves. The beginning of Malachim Aleph, we read of the last moments in the life of Eliyahu Anavi as he is accompanied by his disciple, his Talmud Elisha. Eliyahu had been told that he must prepare to be taken to heaven in a whirlwind. And so he wishes to take leave of his, his beloved Talmud. Three times, Elisha refuses to leave him. Eliyahu casually splits the rivers of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan River, walks across, teacher and pupil. They continue their conversation, an important one, but not relevant to my point. And then we read as follows. And it came to pass as they were walking, walking and talking, that there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two men, whereupon Elio was swept upwards to heaven in a whirlwind. I've often wondered about that last fateful conversation as the two walked, each to his own destiny, Halokh Daber. What did they talk about, Rebbe and Talmud, during that fateful but brief period of time? Oh, how I would have wanted to overhear that conversation. Further, I was also troubled by, what shall I say, the peripatetic nature of the conversation, the walking discussion. Why walking? Why not sitting and talking? Why not standing and talking? In response, I put myself in Alicia's position vis-a-vis -vis my Rebbe, the Rav, and I wonder, what if I were granted but 10 minutes with the Rav, both of us knowing that this was the last chance to talk before the winds bore him away? What words would pass between us? I would not presume to suggest what he would say to me, but why would I say to him? What last message, last impression would I want to leave with the Rebbe? Two things. First, I would walk with him rather than sit and stand for a simple reason. When you sit or stand, you face each other. Eye contact. When you walk, you don't look at each other, generally. And I would say to him, Rebbe, I'm too embarrassed to look you in the eye. I'm too embarrassed. Rebbe, forgive us. Forgive us for taking you for granted. You were so much a part of our lives, so permanent a fixture of our intellectual and spiritual experience that we often fail to tell you how much you meant to us, as children often neglect to tell their parents how much they love them. We were so engrossed in our own growth that we ignored your feelings. I leave you, Rebbe, with a sense of shame. Second, we thank you. Our hearts overflow with gratitude to you, our Rebbe, our master in Torah and in life. There is not one of us who does not owe an undying debt of gratitude. You inspired us, Rebbe. We bathe in admiration of your genius. 
When we were younger, we fought to be accepted as Talmudim in your class. We were actually proud that you took note of us, even if it was to be singled out for rebuke for our Kumiswara, for our intellectual sloth. You were our ideal, our role model, even though that our natural limitations meant that we could never attain your greatness. We thrilled at your virtuosity, your creativity, your originality, and the way you tried to train us to be critical, even critical of you. You gave shape and direction to our lives. We knew that we were in the presence of greatness, that our Rebbe was a unique historical phenomenon, and deep down, deep down, we were secretly frightened at the prospect that someday we would no longer have you with us. So what consolation do we have? We have come here to mourn, to mourn our love, our Rebbe. For now that greatness is gone, hijacked from us by history. No more for us, the exquisite inte intellectual delight of his incomparable shiurim, the aesthetic pleasure of the artistic organization of his masterful Yorosai Toshis, even the edification of his paidim, his personal counsel. The years of his decline have drained us of most of our tears. But with the finality of the Petira of Radov, we utter a collective sigh at Rev Hashemayim, a composite sigh composed of one part of disconsolate availus, endless and bottomless sadness, and we join the family in that thoroughly and completely. And also a one part of pity for the world, Arachmonis of the Welt, that has been denied now the privilege of his presence. One part of a promise to the love that neither he nor his derech nor his ashkofa will leave our midst or ever be forgot. And that is why I would walk with him, haloch v'daber, because sitting or standing implies an end. Now, no future, stagnation. Whereas walking implies something unfinished, a destination that beckons, a goal not yet achieved, and therefore a command to continue. Our loyalty to the love will live as long as we do, as long as our town need them do, as long as this yeshiva exists. It will go on and on here in this yeshiva, where he presided as Rosh Yeshiva for half a century. His presence will always be palpable. And finally, one more part of that side. I would hesitate to tell it to him to his face. And that is one part of love. Yes, to this scion of Litvaks for generations, those of emotional restraint who abjured any display of affection as unbecoming ostentation, to this commanding and self-disciplined intellect we express openly and unabashedly our affection and our love. And so I would conclude my Halokh Daber session by saying to him, Rebbe, we loved you, and if we felt inhibited and embarrassed to say it to you to your face, we profess it to you now. We feared you, we admired you, but we loved you as well. Oh, how appropriate it would have been for the love that living dynamo to leave the world as Eliyahu Anovi did. Vayal Eliyahu Basara Hashemayim in a dramatic end, but alas, that was not granted to him. When the Rav Rashid of Shapiro was here a few years ago, six, seven, eight years ago, to give a shear, the Rav came. It was the first time he met the Rav. And when the Rav came up, Shapiro ran to him and gave him a kiss. And he whispered to me, this is a mitzvah to kushna sefer Torah. It's a mitzvah to kiss a sefer Torah. You know, nothing lasts forever. Even a sefer Torah doesn't last forever. Sometimes it's a sefer Torah and nisraf, such as the one consumed together with Rabbi Hanina ben Tradyan. And at the other times, the sefer Torah doesn't have such such mazel, the mazel of a dramatic and end whereupon gvil nisraf osios porchos ba'avir. 
Sometimes, instead, it is a Sefer Torah, a Bola. It suffers, withering away slowly, as painfully letter by letter is wrenched away from it until it is no more. That, Ba'avon Hussein Uhur Rabbim, was the bitter end to the life of our very own Sefer Torah, the very thing he feared most. In the words of Eov, Eis asher yargorti yovoli, what I feared has come to pass. But we know that even if the Sefer Torah is gone, the Torah of our love will always live on, live on with us. I just, a few weeks ago, heard of something that happened at the Briski Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. The details are fuzzy. The story is essentially true. Very recently it happened, maybe a few months ago. A very, very old man, bent over, appeared in the Briski Yeshiva, sat down at the Bismedrish, after he took out a Gemara, and began to learn by himself. Whereupon, the David Soloveitchik, the son of the Velvet Soloveitchik, came over to him and greeted him. The old man said, uh, this is the Chevron the Yeshiva? This is the Yeshiva of Chevron? And the said, nay, this is the Brisky Yeshiva, the Yeshiva of Brisk. The man, old man, looked up in disbelief, opened his eyes, and he said, Reb Chaim Lepmach? Is Reb Chaim still alive? It transpired that the old man had studied in Brisk when Reb Chaim was still alive and left in 1913. Caught up in the Russian Communist Revolution, he was then exiled to a remote area of Georgia, completely cut off from contact with Jews. He had a few Gemaras that he managed to take along, and he learned for 75 years. Didn't see not only another Litvak, he didn't see another Jew. Saw nobody. Learned by himself. And now with the great Ruula that came to Soviet Jewry, he came to Yerushalayim, and when he heard that it was the Brisky Yeshiva, he said, Reb Chaim Lepnoch, and indeed, Reb Chaim Lepnoch, and will always serve as long as there'll be Talmud Torah. And we are here to say, we the Talmudim of the grandson of Reb Chaim, that Reb Yashar Be'er Salavetik Lepnoch, he still lives and always will live in our midst. I conclude with what I read someplace about the Gorn of Vilna, who said that the Olam Ha'emes, they await the coming of a Talmud Chacham, and when he arrives, they accompany him to the Yeshiva Shalmalo in Gan Eden, so that he can deliver a shear and expound his best chidushim in that great Russia. The story is that he even said that the Talmud Chacham is given 180 days to prepare that shear. Farewell, Rebbe. You always prepared well for us, well and meticulously. You no doubt will do the same now. And when you give your shir, your drasha before the Bezen Shalmala, with all the gedole hadoas of all ages in attendance, those who were your closest companions and comrades during the years of your lonely sojourn, remember us, Rabbi, your family and your Talmidim, even as we shall always remember you. And may your schus and the schus of your Torah and your chidushim protect us, grant us health of body and mind and soul, and shalom, shalom above all else in every way. Grant us avas Hashem, we avas Torah, avas Yisrael and avas Abrius, your family, your Talmidim and their Talmidim, and all of us, all of this yeshiva to which he came half a century ago, which you graced with your greatness of mind and heart, which was your home and our home together, and in which your presence will always be palpable, and from which your memory will never fade, for you are a blessing to us in our lifetime. And Zecher Tzadikim Levracha, your memory will be a blessing to us forever. Adias HaGoel, the Mehera of Yameinu.